African Brotherhood, solidarity, and shared values based on mutual respect. We can also share our experience with those beyond the African shores on the basis of mutual respect. If you want to know what we are doing in a respectful way, we can share with you. But no lectures. The four principles have served us well. In the last 35 years, the economy has been growing at the rate of 6.2% per annum. It now stands at 40.5 billion if you use the exchange rate method and 116 billion if you use the PPP method. With the activation of the oil sector, which has been dormant ever since 2006 when we discovered the petroleum, and if you add the expected average growth rate of 6% per annum post COVID-19, the combination will expand the economy to an estimated $67 billion by 2026 using the exchange rate method and $193 billion using the PPP method, meaning that the economy will be growing at the rate of between 9-10% in the initial years of oil production. This rate of growth, although reasonable, is not what I want. With the rise of the literacy rate from 43% in 1986 to now 76.5%, we can achieve much higher, much faster rates of growth, and I will see to that. These, these rates of growth, 6%, that is calculated by we have achieved rapid rates of growth in some sectors. These isolated positive rapid rates of growth can be generalized throughout the whole economy. There is a French phrase that I have never forgotten since my aborted attempt to learn French 59 years ago in 1962 at Antare. Apart from Rapport, Ouvre Rapport, Je ne comprends pas, ETC, I will never forget the phrase Dolmir Buku. Certainly in Uganda, I do not know about the other parts of Africa. There has been a lot of Dolmir Buku, Kulambara, Nino Matek, Okwebaka, Kugwesejera. Kulara sana, too much sleep. In Uganda, yesterday I was talking to one delegate, I will not mention the person, the delegate who is sitting here, but I will not mention the person for diplomatic reasons. That person was saying that, but you people, how do you manage to be poor here? With so much, so much rain, so much good soil, and you are poor? Somebody is sitting there in the audience, but I will not tell you who that person is. They ask that question, which I've been asking you myself. That is how you would get poverty with people who have got good land, with fresh water, but only working for the stomach, or call the Chida Chonka, Teach me each keken and no effort at all for the pocket. Sleeping, however, is also good in its own paradoxical way. 
There are so many things you do not worry about because you are asleep. A snake can come and enter the bedroom when you are asleep and it will bite you and you die peacefully because you did not have to you do not have time to worry. When you are awake, however, you worry about so many realities that you continue to face. The NRM has been able to wake up sections of the population of Uganda. In 1986, Uganda was a land of shortages, no sugar, no soap, no paraffin, no textiles, no sodas, no salt, no beer, no petrol, etc., etc. With the limited waking up of some of the sections of the population, Uganda now is a country of surpluses. Maize, where we produce 5 million tons per year, but consume only 1 million, one million tons within Uganda. Milk, we produce 2.6 billion liters, but consume only 800 million liters. Bananas, beef, sugar, where we produce 600,000 tons, but consume only 380,000 tons. Here, Nazaka Kushkuru, Mwishimua Uhuru Kenyatta, Amenupatia Mukataba Watani Elifu Elifu Tisaini Kwakira Mwaka. Vile vile nataka kushukuru dada yetu Samia, Excellency Samia. Ameturusu kuuza sukari Tanzania. Asante sana. Nataka kushukuru His Excellency Daishimie Burundi wananua sukari yetu. Nataka kushukuru His Excellency Chisekedi wana rusu sukari yetu Kongo. Nataka kushukuru His Excellency Salva Kiir wana rusu sukari yetu South Sudan na idadi ingine. Otherwise we were stuck with sugar producing 600,000 tons but consuming only 380,000 tons. Cement, steel bars, Mitayimba, tires and tubes for motorcycles, textiles, ceramic tiles, coffee, coffee, big, uh, seven million bags, tea. Your country now, in spite of only about 40% of the people waking up, 60% are still asleep. But these 40% who have woken up, have produced so many products that the, that, that the internal market is not enough. Therefore, the small colonial enclave economy of 1971 that had been wiped out by the Amin regime has been restored, greatly expanded, and totally new products have been added. This has now vindicated the stand of the NRM ever since 1965, encapsulated in the four principles, one of which is Pan-Africanism. Some of the people in Africa, here in Uganda, they talk of tribes, the tribes, religion, oh, now, let them buy the sugar now. Let the tribes buy the sugar. If the tribes are important, why do we have a surplus of, of maize and sugar and all which, which they cannot be bought? The NRM has been telling you from 1965 that Pan-Africanism is the way for Africa to go. 
Now that you, you, you have woken up a bit, you are now seeing it for yourselves now. The question is, when all the Ugandans wake up and start using their assets fully, land, labor, capital, to create more wealth in the four sectors of commercial agriculture, industry, services, and ICT, who will buy or utilize all those products? Will the internal market of Uganda be enough? The answer is a clear no. The internal market cannot be enough. If serious production takes off in Uganda and also in the other African countries. Do we need examples? Look at China and India. Each of them has got an internal market of 1.4 billion people. Yet, they have been greatly assisted by exporting to other countries, including the African ones. How could then the population of Uganda, of 46 million people, be considered enough to sustainably stimulate and absorb the enhanced products of the Ugandans that have woken from the slip of ignorance about modern opportunities? This is the moment the Ugandans and the other Africans need to answer the question. Is this generation of African leaders determined to build a Latin America in Africa or a United States of Africa in Africa? In 1976, when the British settlers in North America got independence, they wisely decided to unite the 13 colonies of the British, of Virginia, New York, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maryland, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Delaware, North Carolina, South Carolina, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Georgia. They have been adding other states ever since. That is how you now have the mighty United States of America. The Spanish colonies in South America, on the other hand, decided to remain scattered into the 18 countries of Latin America, of Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Brazil, French Guyana, Paraguay, Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay. What is the result after 246 years? Prosperity in the United States of America and misery in Latin America, almost universally. How will a big business enterprise in Honduras, population 9.9 .9 million, Guatemala, 17.9 million, Costa Rica, 5 million, Panama, 4.3 million, ETC, how will this enterprise, big businesses succeed? How will they succeed? Even in bigger countries like Brazil, population 212 million, may not easily succeed for the reason that even bigger countries like China and India still need additional markets. By 1900, Argentina was the 10th richest country in the world. What then happened? It was the biggest export of beef in the world. That is what I was taught in primary three in 1955. What then happened? It seemed the emergence of the protected beef market of the European Union may have been the cause, may have been one of the causes 
of Argentina's decline. I would therefore like to use this occasion to remind the African fraternity that economic and, where possible, political integration in Africa is a sign qua non of the success for Africa. If we are to address the issue of the prosperity of our people and strategic security of Africa, apart from other considerations. I'm glad we are working on the continental free trade area for the common market of the whole of Africa and on the confederation of East Africa as a first step with East African political federation. In East Africa, we should not repeat the mistake of 1963 when some actors made us miss our objective of the political federation. And on, on, on page 15, I have there the picture of our elders, Mzee Kenyatta, Mwari Minyerere, Dr. Obote, on the 3rd of June, 1963. And the, and the headline of the Uganda Agas, which you will see in this booklet here, of that day, was East African leaders call for Kenya's independence now and federation this year. Top level talks end in Nairobi, 3rd of June, 1963. We must, where we can, build a center of gravity for the African race. The African race must have a center of gravity. There are small countries in the world. However, many of them have centers of gravity. You have got small countries in Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Denmark, small, small countries. But they have got, they have got centers of gravity. USA is the center of gravity for the West, West Europeans. It's their center of gravity. When they're in trouble, it is the one which rescues them. When Hitler wanted to take them over, uh, and after had taken them over, who rescued them? The USA and somebody else, whom they don't talk about now. Russia, for the Balkans, the Slavic nations of Eastern Europe have a center of gravity in Russia. China for the Far East, India for South Asia. Where is the economic and strategic center of gravity of the African race? Where is it? When you see black people suffering almost everywhere, everywhere the black people are suffering. You put on TV, you'll see black people suffering all over the world. In Africa here, they are suffering. In the USA, they are suffering. In Brazil, they are suffering. It is partly on account of lacking this center of gravity. Nobody cares about Africans. Nobody thinks Africans. I shouldn't, no, no, nobody is careful with Africans. I shouldn't do this because the Africans will be unhappy. No. Africans don't matter. In order, therefore, solve the problem of the new happy phenomenon of surpluses in Uganda. Now in Uganda, there's a new problem, surpluses. Amaido, Duma, Ebikado, Vinji Kamara. So Echengara has become a problem. But the, the Chengara is a good problem. 
In order, therefore, to solve the problem of the new happy phenomenon of surplus in Uganda, we need to deal, along with our brothers and sisters in Africa, with three issues, regional and continental integration, to unite the regional and continental markets, to support production of goods and services better. Higher purchasing power in Uganda so that Ugandans can buy more. This is the answer for the, for the markets. Number three, and good quality products at comparative cost that can be accepted in national, regional, continental, and international markets. These are the three answers to the issue of Echengera, surpluses, which is a new problem in Uganda. To intensify the struggle for social economic transformation, we shall aggressively and without compromise deal with some obstacles. There was some resistance by some parasite groups to, to our policies of creating and properly using the wealth funds such as operational wealth creation money, youth funds, women fund, the Mioga fund, ETC. We have been having resistance on that. The last time you say, I was going to get on over one of Baze, what you Abomgeto Abarabe, Abadaba Abarabe, 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 Omuganda wa gambela nti echiri mutu. Chumanyi wana nyini cho. Chensiwe na wangetu yefaba chumanyi. Implementing free education in government primary and secondary schools. That free education must be implemented. Providing free vaccines and therapeutic drugs in government health centers. Protecting Bibanja owners over the iniquitous Milo land system. Ensuring that the feeder roads are in good condition following the provision of good road equipment for all districts. Fighting corruption of government officials, including magistrates and the policemen. And dealing decisively with the cattle thieves and those who steal crops from the gardens. The wealth funds will be concentrated at the parish level in the parish model, except for the Mioga funds that will remain at the constituency. The wealth funds, unlike in the past, will be controlled by the members and not by the government officials. Cow, operational, no, no, no. no. The only prohibition will be to divert the money to non-mission areas. The allocations will be grants to the parish circles 
In the past, it was government officials to select beneficiaries. The members will now prioritize their location themselves. With free education and after due consideration, there will be no head teacher that will be tolerated if, we, if he or she reimposes school charges. Dealing with corruption and stealing drugs, part of the solution is e-government. All government transactions will be computer-based, no more human-to-human -human contact. This will be easier to monitor even for remote supervisions. The corona pandemic hit some sectors badly, especially the hotels, the performing arts, the border borders, the sportsmen ETC. This financial year and the next financial year, we have put aside 464 billion, about $130 million, to help these groups as soon as the residential residual lockdown is removed. The UDB will be further empowered to give low interest loans to manufacturers, agricultural entrepreneurs, and some actors in the services sector, such as tourism. As far as Corona-19 virus is concerned, we shall open up once we have vaccinated fully 4.8 million people as follows. Population over 50 years of age, the number is 3.3 .3 million. Health workers in public and private health units, 150,000. Teachers and lecturers, 550,000. Security personnel, 250,000. Those with comorbidities, although they are below 50 years, uh, those are 500,000. Total, 4.8 million. Until today, we have, we have so far vaccinated 375,000 people. Apart from importing the vaccines from others, we are developing our own vaccine. Able to deal with all the known variants. When we are trying to look for the vaccines, for, for the, equip, for the equipment, we are being told about Africans. Africans, you, don't make, you shouldn't make vaccines. You should import. That's what they were telling us. You want equipment for vaccine? What, you Africans, what for? Your job is to import. But I rejected that. We shall import once or twice and we shall make our own vaccine. We are moving very well. Only that we delayed because of our slave-minded public servants who waste so much time because they have no confidence in themselves. We have also been trying in humans some therapeutic materials which seem to be effective. Our diagnostics are reaching industrial level and we have finalized the construction plans for the diagnostic factory. Construction should commence soon. On prevention, the tough measures we took limited the damage. Until the 8th of May, we have had 442,226 infections, 41,652 recoveries, and 346 deaths. Finally, I thank their excellencies that have honored us with their presence on this occasion. This is a real brotherhood. We also appreciate the delegations that came from all the other countries. I need to express my concern to African brothers and sisters that are here today. 
and those that are not here. That the situation in a number of points in Africa does not give credit to the African people. The security situations in Libya, Mali, Niger, some parts of Nigeria, Chad, Central African Republic, some parts of Cameroon, Eastern Congo, Somalia, recently Northern Mozambique, it is, must be addressed and can be addressed. First of all, the situation in Libya was created by the arrogant and irresponsible actions of some actors that took actions that were against the express position of the African Union. I can reveal to you that those actors had a narrow escape. When some actors started attacking Libya against the decision of the African Union, I contacted His Excellency Jacob Zuma of South Africa and proposed that African armies that so decided to intervene in Libya and confront and teach a lesson to those aggressors. We were let down by Muammar Gaddafi, who abandoned Tripoli without a fight. Although at that time I did not have a direct link with Muammar Gaddafi, I advised his envoy, who came to see me here, to turn Tripoli into a Stalin grad. With H.E. Jacob Zuma, we had to work out a solution for the aircraft and cruise missiles that some people use to attack defenseless people from far away so that if, they, if the aggressors so wished could come on the ground and we fight man to man. Such a confrontation would of course have been imposed on us unnecessarily we have, since a long time ago, started the, stated that the African patriots, like we in the NRM, are neither pro-West nor pro-East. We are first and foremost pro-Africa. Because there is something called Africa. When I came in the government in 19, when we were still fighting, are you pro-East or pro-West? Idiot, I am pro-Africa. I cannot be here to be pro others, no, but not pro myself. It is on account of that that good friends should only deal with contentious strategic African issues via the African Union. Bypassing the African Union is not acceptable when it comes to dangerous strategic African issues. We have no interest in fighting anybody except poverty and underdevelopment in Africa, starting with Uganda. However, some actors are always in search of enemies. They are looking for enemies. You are not an enemy, they declare you an enemy. Okay, if you want to be an enemy, you can sort out issues. Our role there is to advise those who are advisable, but also do our patriotic duty if unavoidable. Unfortunately, the Libyans collapsed quickly. On account of that, much of Northwest Africa has, has been with security problems that were not, were not there before. Libya, Chad, Mali, Niger, parts of Nigeria, Central African Republic, and Cameroon. Who is responsible for this hemorrhage? I hear people talking of accountability. Who is accountable for this suffering? Who caused all this? 
Of course, Muammar Gaddafi had his own problems. I had had the task of fighting him twice, 1972 and 1979, as he intervened in Uganda on the side of Idi Amin because Idi Amin was a Muslim. However, foreign armies attacking an African country against the express objection of the African Union is not a solution. The huge concomitant suffering of the Africans in Libya and the surrounding countries has proven that if any has proven has proven that if any proof was needed. Africa can defend itself against any and all aggressors if we coordinate. In 1963, our leaders met in Addis Ababa. All the 36 of them that time and declared that the rest of Africa must be freed peacefully or Africa would use force. This was 1963. That time, some of the actors thought, and they seem to think now, that, that this was just idle talk. Exactly 11 years later, in 1974, the African armies of Mozambique, Angora, and Guinea-Bissau supported by the courageous Mwari Nyerere, Kenneth Kaunda, Sekoture, Bomidien, Nasa, and Brifre Nkrumah, and the socialist countries had defeated the Portuguese African armies, totaling almost 200,000 soldiers. Just before this, just before this victory, there had been the 1973 Arab-Israel War, where the Egyptian army put up a better performance and quite bled the Israelis before the latter crossed the canal and surrounded the Egyptian second and third armies in Suez and Port Said. They, the Israelis, badly needed resupplies by the USA. However, the USA had a problem because many of the European countries did not want to refuel the American transport planes in fear of the Arab anger. The Arabs had, had announced the 1973 oil boycott against those that they saw as their enemies. That left the Portuguese islands of the Azores. In the USA National Security Council meeting of 1974, the issue of using the Azores came up. Somebody in the meeting pointed out that Africans will be very annoyed. Henry Kissinger, who was said to be a clever man, he said to have said that African anger does not matter because they have no capacity to enforce it. Exactly five months from the date of that meeting, the Africans who did not matter defeated the Portuguese who mattered. I'm told Kizinja is still alive. It would be good for his record if he cleared this allegation. It is up to us to show all and sundry that we matter and we have the capacity. We defeated the Islamic hoodlums in Somalia. When we want Somalia, th these idiots, these idiots were calling us kafiri. That we are kafiris. Yes, we are kafiris, but this is our land. If you don't want to be in the land of the kafiri, go to Pakistan or to other places where you come from. This is our land. This is the land of the kafiris, this is the land of those Christians, the land of Muslims, which is our land. So if you bring your rubbish, we, we, we deal with you. Like we dealt with the, those idiots in, in Somalia. We defeated the racist fights in Southern Africa. We can defend Africa if we act together and act right. Back to Uganda, back to Uganda now. The elections are over. I 
karuru kagwa banange let us get down to work the four economic sectors where there are jobs and wealth are commercial agriculture emu with the chibaro chura aimar otita counting profitability industries services and ict with your individual savings collective savings by groups borrowing from banks or with the government support you should enter one or more of these sectors so as to chase poverty from your homesteads to get wealth and jobs for some of your family and also for others i thank you and i wish you good luck Your Excellence, indeed, you are a God sent leader to Uganda. And to prove this, for the last two or so many days, it has been raining cats and dogs. But today, even the rains decided to hold to see this function a success. Your Excellency, sir, as we move on to the second last item on our program, allow me to introduce a delegation from the Pan-African-led women's organization led by their excellencies Eunice Ipinge from Nib Namibia, Dilamin Bathabede from South Africa, Sakilin Kama from Mali, Dr. Honorable Susan Kolimba from Tanzania, Tessa Ntash Natasha Likati from Eswatin and Grace Kabayo from Uganda. Your Excellence, allow me to present two cultural groups to entertain you and your guests. And amongst the groups, I want to invite a young girl, aged 12 years, and called Esther Adieyo Kelo to recite a poem entitled, Celebrating a Dependable Leader. Esther, please, come over. As Esther comes over, Your Excellency, 
I want to introduce to you the director of ceremony of this function and the co-directors of ceremonies. The director of ceremony is none other than Esther Ambayo, the woman member of parliament elect Luka district. We also have Brigadier General Flavia Biekwaso. These are the co-directors. We also have Kano Pade Ankunda. And lastly, we have Madam Alice Mwanguzi. Esther, over to you. Excellency, President Yoe Chibuhaburua Kaguta Museveni, the First Lady, Honorable Janet Kataha Museveni, Excellencies, Heads of State and Governments, fellow humanity, good afternoon. Your Excellency, President Museveni, I am Esther Ajek Okelo. I come from Namukora Sub-County, Chua East, Kitgum District. I am a granddaughter of the late President General Tito Okelo Lutwa and a primary six pupil at Green Hill Academy. Your Excellency, your magnanimous heart resulted in your reconciliation with my late grandfather, General Tito Okelo Lutwa. Your Excellency, we thank you for you never persecuted or had assassinated any of the past leaders of Uganda. It is well known that assassinating your political opponents has never been in your vocabulary and practice. That is why you have been able and you are still able to work with their children, grandchildren, and close associates. We thank you for this exceptional heart which God gave you. Therefore, Your Excellency, it is because of your reconciliatory heart that I, the granddaughter of the late President General Tito Okelo Twa, can stand before you at this historical moment. I am standing here when the whole world is watching to, as a testimony of your exemplary leadership to recite a poem in your honor. This poem is titled, Celebrating a Dependable Leader. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice for Muse Alaide. Lord, today, Ugandans stand in reverence before you to rededicate your servant leader, Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, to you. Your servant leader, who behaves not like the hired hand, we beseech your divine wisdom, protection, grace, and favor upon him and upon this great land. Lord, as we went to the ballot, we raise our voices to you, that through us, you anoint a leader best intention for the aspirations of the people of Uganda, a leader who would guide his people to secure their future. And Lord, through us Ugandans, your will was done. For like it is said, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Ugandans did not kick away the canoe, which helped them to cross the river. And thus, Lord, we are here to celebrate your will. Our people say, when the roots are deep, there is no need to fear the wind. Your Excellency, President Museveni, your leadership roots 
go deep, deep, deep. Musei, you have taken Uganda through the darkest nights. Therefore, fellow Ugandans, no wind will destabilize this land. The journey to social economic transformation, the journey to prosperity and peace is a million year march. Today, the country pauses to reflect on the five year speech of this long journey. The history of the human race is filled with intense tragedy and extraordinary inspiration. We are capable of building communities, nations, and civilizations that nurture, transform, and empower. But unfortunately, we are also capable of sustaining insecurity, poverty, disaster, and distress. It all depends on the shepherd at that time, the leader at that time. At a time of great challenges coming from the world and humanity, like HIV, AIDS, Ebola, COVID-19, locusts, floating islands, rising water le levels, destruction of the environment, erosion of values, and unprecedented hate speech worldwide. We are here today to celebrate a shepherd who is willing to lead his people to a shared prosperity. A shepherd, easy in manner, yet solid as steel. A leader who got gifted with rare elastic patience. And as John Kabat-Zinn said, patience is a form of wisdom. It demonstrates that we understand and accept the fact that sometimes things must unfold in their own times. He positively changed the course of Uganda's history. He wrote a new chapter for the women of Uganda. The women who never featured as an item on the national agenda. The women who were any other business, if at all, on the national grid. The women who are now on a visible and on a steady road to meaningful, not cosmetic empowerment. A leader who is always striving to give the youth a good livelihood, focusing on job creation through a myriad of projects. To date, children of universal primary education sit in the August House. President Museveni has given a voice to the elderly and the disabled. The women, the youth, and the disabled now have a voice in parliament. We are celebrating a human being, not an angel. Did you hear me call him an angel? No, but it is right and fitting to call him an exceptional, exemplary leader. Here is a great Pan-Africanist, a man who never opens his mouth without mentioning how crucial it is for Africa to unite, for East Africa to unite, so that we can have a strong bargaining power and a strong market for our products. We are celebrating a leadership which talks and practices peaceful conflict resolution, a leader who has been instrumental in building regional and continental bridges of peace. He sends emissaries to grind millet, not to break the grinding stone. A leader, sower of mustard seed of stability, which has now, gro now grown into a huge oak tree, giving shelter to all Ugandans. He offered an, an olive branch and amnesty to those who fought to destabilize the country. And he has always embraced a broad-based outlook in government formation. A leader who always calls on board 
all Ugandans, irrespective of whether they have voted for him or not. A leader who knows that authority comes from God. God has a place in his life and calling. A leader whose rib, his better half, the first lady, Honorable Janet Kataha Museveni, is God-fearing, cool, measured, knowledgeable, is always by his side as an anchor. The rib herself, a leader in her own right, giving testimony to the biblical, he who finds a good wife, finds a good thing, and obtains favor from the Lord. Seated at the helm of power are these two children of the Christian revival movement, both walking the talk. Like Abraham Lincoln put it, I walk slowly, but I never walk backward. There are still some gaps and challenges in so many areas, but this leadership has taken an appreciable giant stride. Today, you can travel on tarmac from the most southern tip to the most northern tip in the country. The country is connected. The oil pipeline running from Uganda to Tanzania is on course. Our land of canine is in sight. The story of national resistance movement achievements is too long to be condensed in a few lines. Today and always, Uganda's story must be told. Africa has the opportunity to reposition herself as the cradle of transformation, innovation, and peace. Your Excellency, President Museveni, Ladit Lobo, Omukulembeze, Chiongozi, Omwebembezi, Afande, Musei. May this term be one inspired by African aspirations and our value systems of integrity, transparency, honesty, unity, and the spirit of Ubuntu. We are the people of the Great Lakes and the cradle of Africa. We are the leaders of our own transformation and will inspire the world for a unified, secure, future for God and my country. This poem was written by Honorable Mary Karoro Okurut. Thank you. Thank you, Esther, for that wonderful poem. And uh, I want to invite Crane performers to give us one vibe as we turn towards the end of our function.
Crane performers, that is enough. Crane performers, that is enough, please. Let's all stand. Let's all stand to singing the national anthems in a reverse order. But the departure will also be in a reverse order. His Excellency, the President, will first see off his guests in the following order. We shall start from DRC, followed by Kenya, followed by Guinea, South Sudan, Namibia.